Hello, everyone. Welcome to uh, our Native American Heritage Month event, to our in-person and virtual um, participants. My name is Kirsten Thomas, and I'm a member of this year's planning committee. Thank you all for coming. Um, I'm so excited for this event. Uh, like all great teachers, Professor Duncan shares what he knows with the kind of open-heartedness and authenticity that um, really resonates and makes you trust him and remember what he said. And I, I think that um, most of the people, I suspect anyway, from having had the opportunity to sit in on one of his workshops, that um, what you hear today is going to stick with, with you long after this event. Um, and I'm really looking forward to spending time with our amazing student participants. They're just going to renew your hope in humanity. Um, they're wonderful. Uh, I'd now like to introduce Dr. Smith, our president. With nearly 30 years of experience in education, Dr. Smith is a highly regarded, enthusiastic leader who advocates for student success at all levels. And she's come. Come on up, Dr. Smith. <laughs> Without further ado, you don't need the script. I'm sorry, Kirsten. <laughs> I'm always like very short on the bio intro, so I apologize for that. And welcome. Thank you so much, everybody who's here in person. To all of you who are online, woo, we're so glad you're joining us. Um, for what will be an incredibly interesting um, and I believe very inspirational time today, both with our guest speaker, who I will introduce shortly, and our, of course, our student and alumni panelists who are wonderfully engaging. Um, okay, so we, I wanna say thank you to Kirsten for getting us started today. Really appreciate all the hard work that you do and all the work that you do in putting together our library guides which I gotta tell you all, these say the lib guides, and I'm like, what's a lib guide? <laughs> like, yo, oh, oh, library, got it. Um, so thank you for that, because they're always fantastic and comprehensive um, and very meaningful for all of us to be able to access and learn. Um, so I actually, I would also like to, Kirsten, where, where do people find the library guides? Is it up on the screen for you all? Thank you. See, I have, a, I have to take my glasses off to see the screen. Um, so please, I encourage everyone in your free time to access this, these guides and you'll, there's just so much good information for all of us to learn. I also wanna say thank you to John Bastian, uh, Sherry Moore, Michelle Reese, and of course, Kirsten, uh, for our auxiliary services team who works behind the scenes and others, any others, I don't know who you all are out there, <laughs> um, who really helped make today happen. So we really appreciate all of you. Um, as you already heard, we're excited to welcome Professor Rowdy Duncan, who is joining us, and our student moderators, who you will hear from shortly. Um, folks that I think a lot at the college know, and if you don't know, Cordero Holmes, Becca Namachanja, and Sonia Tom, uh, you'll want to get to know them. <laughs> uh, they're amazing, wonderful individuals, and we thank you so much for being here today, for leading um, our panel discussion, and just for always sharing generously of who you are, your story, your insights, your wisdom, and your expertise. Thank you. Now, if you're not aware, um, a little bit coincidentally, we're actually having two events today celebrating Na Native American Heritage Month. So our time this afternoon that promises to be amazing, as well as this evening, um, you are invited back to the conference center or you're invited back online to join us um, as our award-winning public radio station KJZZ 91.5 news team will host a panel conversation about and this is the title of it, The Food, Water, and the Future of Tribal Lands. This will be at 6 p.m. this evening, again, both in person and virtual. And Gabriel Petrizario, uh, KJZ's 
KJZZ's Tribal Natural Resources reporter will be here to moderate the discussion. So I think it'll just, again, we, it'll be a fantastic time of learning for all of us. Highly encourage you to be able to join again online or in person if you can. KJZZ, we thank you for hosting this and for keeping us informed all year long. These panel discussions give us the opportunity to bring the entire community together for a shared learning experience. So to that end, I'd like to share just a little bit of some facts about the history of Native American Heritage Month. Um, Native American Heritage Month rose out of a nearly 100 year long effort for recognition. Among the earliest proponents for recognition was Dr. Arthur Caswell Parker, the director of the Rochester Museum in New York. So for those of you who don't know, I'm from Rochester, New York. <laughs> um, and it, that museum is now called the Rochester Museum of Arts and Sciences, and it's wonderful. Um, so he was one of the earliest proponents. Um, he was a Seneca Indian, was a noted anthropologist, historian, and author whose great uncle was Brigadier General Eli S. Parker, who, happened, who was then Secretary to General Ulysses S. Grant during the Civil War. The first and was the first American Indian to serve as Commissioner of Indian Affairs in the Department of the Interior. He was also served as the first president of the Society for American Archaeology from 1935 to 1936. Dr. Parker proposed the creation of an American Indian Day as a day of recognition. He began by convincing the Boy Scouts of America to set aside a day to honor the first Americans. At that same time, Red Fox James, a Blackfoot Indian, began riding across the country. Do y'all know this history? <laughs> okay, so he began riding across the country on horseback to seek approval from each of the states for a day to honor Native Americans. James arrived at the White House on December 14, 1915, with 24 state endorsements. However, very unfortunately, um, they're, they're efforts for an official na National Native American Day did not happen at that time. And some states went on to designate what was Columbus Day as Native American Day or Indigenous Peoples Day. Uh, this recognition and celebration didn't come about until 1990. It was in 1990 that the U.S. government finally passed a joint resolution declaring November to be National American Indian Heritage Month. And then in 2009, Congress passed House Joint Resolution 40, the, quote, Native American Heritage Day Act of 2009, which designates the Friday immediately following Thanksgiving Day of each year as, a, as Native American Heritage Day. President Barack Obama signed the legislation and issued a proclamation designating November 2009 as, Native, as National Native American Heritage Month and November 27, 2009 as Native American Heritage Day. So we are thrilled to be able to participate in celebrating Native American Heritage Month and, and having opportunities and setting aside time right, because we know time is really hard to set aside to really learn and keep growing together. And so I just hope that today's event inspires all of us to further explore the rich and dynamic culture, history, and legacy of Native Americans. So now we're going to move on to the highlight of the day, Professor Rowdy Duncan, um, who will help, del help us delve into the heart of indigenous wisdom and experience. Professor Duncan serves as residential faculty at Phoenix College, teaching interpersonal and intercultural communications. Mr. Duncan is a seasoned public speaker and an expert at non-hierarchical leadership and facilitating workshops addressing colorblindness, interest-based negotiations, nonviolent communication and conflict resolution, positive masculinity, and seeing people as possibilities. Professor Duncan is a specialist in justice, equity, diversity, and inclusion, also known through its acronym as JEDI. So he's a JEDI specialist. In, he's also a member of the Healing Racism Public Dialogue Series 
and a facilitator for Maricopa Community College's Seven Habits of Highly Effective People workshops. In 2023, he earned a certificate in ketamine-assisted integration coaching from the Trauma Transformation Network. He also, as if this was not enough, <laughs> he also co-wrote the proposal for Paradise Valley Community College's Leadership Certificate. Professor Duncan was a 2014 winner of the Arizona Diversity Alliance's Diversity Champion Award and the John and Sue Ann Roosh Award for Excellence for the Community College from the League of Inf Sorry, League of Innovation in 2015. So we are delighted he is here to share his time and his talents with us. Would you please join me in welcoming Professor Rowdy Duncan to the podium. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, it's interesting to be kind of back home. Uh, for those of you that don't know, I started as an advisor. This is where I began my Maricopa journey, so it's nice to see some advisor friends while I'm here. Um, so, yeah, thank you. Um, real quick, before I start, uh, just doing like an informal land acknowledgements. Uh, I do want to acknowledge that the land that we currently occupy is basically Autumn land, uh, and without Autumn land, we wouldn't be here today. Uh, and without that forced sacrifice of stolen land, uh, this space and opportunity wouldn't exist. Uh, I also like to do a water acknowledgement too, just because uh, the Hohokam folks that dug the canals that we put concrete over are why Phoenix exists. And so uh, it's a really wonderful little thing to do to just take a sip of water and appreciate these folks that were like digging with stone tools through that hard caliche dirt like generations ago made sure we had water to drink. Isn't that cool? Uh, people that thought that far forward just to make sure that they could take care of us. So uh, I'm really excited to be here today. Um, also, before I get started, uh, there is one thing I do want to mention. I am not an expert at these things. Um, a lot of this information I got from doing some workshops and having guest speakers uh, that taught me a lot of this. Uh, as far as my own background, I like to be upfront and honest with that, and so people have a sense of where I'm coming from. Um, I'm native through my father, who's Taos Pueblo. However, I wasn't raised in our culture, and part of the reason why is because uh, boarding school stuff, um, he was a very violent alcoholic with drug abuse issues. Um, we had to separate from him and his family, and so his family kind of disowned me uh, about the same time, so they don't really recognize that I'm a member of their family. And so I don't have um, tribal enrollment cards, things like folks that other folks have. And so a lot of this work really represents my, um, my work in trying to come back to my native self and that I didn't get raised with those things. And so please don't make me the expert or authority on this stuff because I'm not. I just have good relations that have taught me a lot. So um, as somebody comes back to get my slides together, uh, I want to acknowledge the folks that uh, helped me learn so much about this. Uh, Lakota Hardin, uh, Angelita Bourbon, um, Belinda Aracho, uh, Araco. Uh, all these folks have been speakers for years and years, and it's really this distilled wisdom that I've made into uh, this presentation. So with that, I'll go ahead and get started. I know uh, I have a lot of things to cover, but I want to do it as quickly and as efficiently as possible because as a professor, the most fun thing to do is not talk, but talk with students. So, um, yeah, if you want to. Okay. So um, the first thing that I wanted to mention is there's a concept called speciesism. Anybody ever heard of that before, speciesism? Some folks know, some folks, yeah. And so uh, speciesism is this idea that happens in Western culture and that it, we value some life over and more than other forms of life. And so um, part of how that works is we tend to put humans at the top of this pyramid. And then if we, if we like you, if you're our pets, so like horses, dogs, cats, you can hang out, you're pretty close, right? We'll actually treat some dogs, cats, pets, better than other humans, sadly. Uh, we'll make sure that they're better taken care of than the people that we pass on the street. Um, then after that, uh, we'll probably be looking at like, whatever we raise for food production, uh, although we don't treat them very well. Uh, so cows, chickens, uh, fish, whatever, right? Like if it really serves like man, then yeah, we kind of like you. But then there's other stuff that we don't want to eat and we're like, oh yeah, jellyfish, oh. 
So we kind of put jellyfish a little bit lower. Uh, we put like any animal that would seem weird to eat like a little bit lower. Uh, and then as we kind of like move further down the spectrum, there's like things that we don't appreciate at all, right? Mosquitoes, like I, I've heard that people are thinking about trying to eradicate mosquitoes. And I was like, man, that's gonna be a real mistake because creator made mosquitoes and something eats mosquitoes and it's part of the whole connection, right? Um, but it's hard because in this Western frame of valuing life, we think some life is more important than others and we value and appreciate its contributions more than others. What's sad though is we've done that with humans too. And so humans' lives are not really all equal either, right? Um, in 2014, uh, Black Lives Matter really came about, right? And as soon as somebody said Black Lives Matter, the very next thing somebody said was, no, 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 all lives matter. And I was like, why'd you have to say that? Like, what's going on with that? So I was trying to think about why was there a need for someone to say that thing? And I think it came from the idea, if we have to recognize that honestly Black Lives Matter don't matter, then we have to recognize that everybody's life is on a hierarchy of value. Um, you know, like we don't appreciate or really love handicapped folks because we don't build buildings to appreciate them. We don't really make software available or technology available. Uh, and it's funny, we act as though disabled is something that like other people will be. Uh, we're gonna get older, right? We're gonna need glasses, we're gonna need mo mobility things, but this will be us. Uh, so when we're a space of disvaluing other forms of life, we put ourselves on the menu as well, right? And so I think when folks were like, oh, well, I don't want to have to look at where my life is on the hierarchy scale, we'll just say all lives matter. Because if I have to recognize black lives don't, in fact, matter, then I'll also see that my life doesn't matter as much as a billionaire, somebody with more power, somebody with more education. Because we created a world that needs to feed and exploit others to, to create the society we've, uh, we've made. And so uh, really like understanding speciesism is, re is really important. So just like kind of think for a second about what I've talked about and if you are gonna make a pyramid or a hierarchy of life in Western civilization, you know, what would be the top, what would be at the middle, what would be at the bottom? So just kind of take a second and think and kind of picture that. So now that you've got kind of that hierarchy in mind, you start to notice that, again, life's not really valued. And it's hard because all life needs other life to exist. Um, but it's difficult because we don't think about those things. We don't like talk about uh, non-human ancestors, non-human relations. Uh, we, don't, we don't give bodies of water sentience, right? Like what would, what would the world look like if bodies of water had rights that we can't pollute them? that we have to honor the sentience and value they bring, right? We couldn't afford to po poison the water. Uh, we couldn't afford to poison the air. And I still think we can't because we still drink and breathe those things. However, again, we've given a uh, voice or precedence to this thing called an economy and we make that value more than human life. Um, and this leads us to, uh, to a thing I like to call col colonization. So colonization is a thing it happened everywhere to all people. Colonization is where people from one group, one area move into another area and they start extracting resources from the new area to bring back to the old area. Uh, some native elders once told me, the problem with a lot of settler colonialists is they just never took their other foot out of the boat. If they just would have taken their other foot out of the boat and really choose to be people of the land on the space that they're occupying, things could have been different.
But this value extraction, this taking things, this moving stuff from one place to another, uh, and marginalizing, right? We create these needless hierarchies of value of life. And we create needless hierarchies at work every day. The boss, the workers. We don't need those things. People all just work. Work gets done. Like, all work is valuable, right? Like, but we value and pay more for some work and pay less than others, and it's all things need to get done, right? We've moved away from this uh, circle, from this recognition that all people do all these things. Uh, and it's rare that anyone sees the world in that way. I remember hearing a story uh, about someone talking to a janitor at NASA. And they're like, why do you work so hard? Why are you so passionate? I'm putting somebody on the moon. And they are, aren't they? Like, they don't need to be doing the math. They don't need to be in mission control. They are part of that work. They are part of what gets that thing done. So when we recognize colonialism is a thing, we then have to recognize everybody on earth has been colonized. Even Europe got colonized by other Europeans. Yeah, but still, right? Like there were native folks, there were indigenous people. Indigenous means to be people of the land of wherever. One of my favorite things is when people are doing land acknowledgements and they're like, we want to we want to acknowledge the Diné people. And I'm like, oh, that's redundant. <laughs> like, Diné means people of the land of, and then you're adding in people. Like, why are we doing that twice? Uh, it's because you don't know how that stuff works, and you don't have a sense of the way that goes. So, and I, another thing that I want to recognize, too, and talk about is there's evidence of colonization that happens pre-European colonial impact, uh, contact. So on this continent, native people colonized one another. They would kidnap each other. They would um, like force them to be part of like uh, work groups. They would uh, force them to be in marriages with other folks. Uh, they would exploit different folks, right? Uh, it would happen in Africa. It happened in Australia. There's evidence of colonization pre-European uh, contact that's always been an issue. And really, so the problem is, is colonization. Right? The, the symptoms of a lot of issue is that we treat each other as something that we can exploit or marginalize or get over on, right? Like it's so hard because like we're trying to like compete or win or beat someone in every interaction. And that doesn't make any sense because we're pack animals. You know, every person is somebody we need. And every time we get over or exploit or win, uh, when we're working with someone, we lose connection and relationship with someone. And it's hard because it creates these divisions. So there's these major themes that I find in, col in colonization that tend to happen. Marginalization, right? So we need to create someone we can exploit or pay less or get over on when we're doing colonization. We're always gonna try to like find a way to exploit someone and then somebody's gonna benefit more from that labor work or effort, right? So we'll create a hierarchy, and then we'll like, okay, the people on the top get more, the people on the bottom get less, and this will be the system. The next thing that happens is we need, we find a way to exploit, right? How can we not properly pay people for labor? How can we not really value what they do uh, by calling it work that doesn't matter? You know, uh, my wife just had our first kid in May, and she, thank you, yeah, we're really excited. Uh, through all this work, uh, a minor miracle happened. He has a medicine man. And like, that's just amazing for me that I can give him something I've never had like that. But this is the power of relationship, right? Um, and so when we look at these themes and how these ways of being are, uh, over and over again, colonization seeks to exploit, marginalize, or create needless hierarchy where we're all exploiting or hurting one another. And this pattern of being, I call colonial thinking, right? It's the way we be with one another. It's the unconscious programming of society that has made this thing happen. And guess who participates in colonial thinking? Everybody. Like I will colonize little ember unconsciously. Uh, and that's a real sad truth about the little guy. Like, I'm going to not value what he has to say because he's just a kid. But he could be right. Ember. 
yeah. Like one of the folks that uh, that helped me learn about this, we had a ceremony because we were thinking about adopting or having our own kid, and we saw in the fire, like in the coals, we saw this little baby. And so Ember's his name from that moment that we had together. And so um, when we can recognize everybody is subject to colonial thinking, we can start identifying ways we're exploiting and hurting one another and recognize this is not the, how we want to be. Because again, you're on the menu to some degree. I tried to think who's at the pinnacle of this hierarchy of like life. And I was like, maybe billionaires? Although like those folks are so unhappy, they're trying to leave the planet in penis-shaped rockets, <laughs> which like, you know, something's got to be going on there. Uh, that makes it a problem, right? Um, if you're, you know, you, sh you should have everything you need and now you're trying to go to a place that's actively attempting to kill you, right? Just to get more resources to, to bring back, right? Like, it's such a crazy idea. Um, but even if you're at the top of a hierarchy, you're fighting to stay there all the time, right? Nobody talk, everybody talks about privilege a lot, right? Like, you know, there's male privilege. Absolutely, there is male privilege. I get that all the time. Did I ask for it? No. Do I receive it? Yes. However, the price of having male privilege is anybody can question if I'm man enough at any point in time, and I have to prove it. I can't prove I'm man enough all the time. But that, like, that, that way of being, that like trying to keep everybody down is exhausting. And there's got to be a better way than just treating everyone like others. And so once we recognize colonial thinking is a pattern and once we can see that we're a little bit too interactional, a little bit, a need to be a little bit more relational with one another, we see that there's a different way of being. And another thing that I want you to all know, you are all indigenous people. Now that doesn't mean you get to be Native Americans, but it does mean that you came from a people who were once descended from the land of wherever, right? And I really want you to go back and figure out who these people were and how did they live? Because that's a piece of indigeneity we need to bring back to figure out how to be better with one another because we've forgotten this for way too long. So uh, an example of how colonization works and how colonization hates indigeneity is, uh, so there's St. Patrick's Day, right? Yay, I'm Irish. Drink beer. The story of St. Patrick's Day is uh, St. Patrick ran the snakes out of Ireland, and so we celebrate that. Those weren't snakes. Those were ladies who practice an earthbound religion, matriarchal women, women, indigenous people. So St. Patrick's Day is a celebration of colonization, of the killing of who Irish people were once, right? And how often have you heard that? Never. Because colonization doesn't want you to remember that thing, right? And so when we all can realize colonization stole something from us and that there is not one group that has practiced colonization only, everybody does it and we've been programmed to do it and all we have to do is start spotting, oh no, I'm marginalizing, I'm creating hierarchy, I'm exploiting. Like, how do I do this? How do I stop doing that? How do I create a space where you can call me out when I do it? Uh, somebody else uh, calls it calling in. I love that. Like, because they're calling me back in the community by saying I'm othering or pushing them away, right? So um, decolonization is necessary for all people to get back to their humanity. Uh, when we can see and recognize when we're doing these patterns, when we make people into others, when we're too interactional, when we're practicing needless hierarchy or we're getting, getting over or someone, um, when we're, we're not treating each other as like an ancestor uh, would, we learn how to do things better. And so uh, most folks stop at decolonization, like let's just stop doing bad things. Uh, it's hard to do something by not doing something, Right? Well, I won't treat everybody bad. Okay, what are you going to do? I don't know, right? Like, and we've come up with anti-racism, and that's kind of good, but it still doesn't, it's just like, racism bad. But it's like, well, what are you going to do instead of racism? Like, there, why don't we have that word? Uh, we need to find that word. And so what I found in relationship with the Native friends that call me family, uh, and I'm so blessed they do, is uh, the thing that points past indigeneity. Um, decolonization to indigeneity. 
And so indigeneity is thinking. We all were tribal people once. And if there's like 40 of us, I can't afford to hate Cordero because <laughs> we live together. And Cordero makes like the really good baskets. Like, you know, we, I got beef, we got to figure it out. He makes the baskets, you know, like, yeah, I hunt, but I mean, <laughs> I can't bring it back without Cordero, you know? Um, we found a way once to live with everybody. And it's not like there was no problems. There was problems, but we figured it out because we absolutely had to because everybody that was in that community provided indispensable value. And how did we do things to be that way? There was no police. Who was the police? Everybody was the police. There was no jail. What, am I going to put Cordero in TP jail? Not that we have TPs, but you know what I mean, right? Like, we can't afford TP jail. <laughs> like, we're going to force them to make baskets in TP jail. Like, how do we think, how did we get past that stuff? How did we problem solve? And man, they have, like, indigenous people across the world have these amazing practices. When we get stuck or when we get deluded or when we think, like I'm a separate or I'm better or whatever, that bring us back. When someone's poisoned by the disease of believing someone is another, one of the practices that happen, God, I need to get better at remembering the names, the tribes that do these things, uh, but I know it's from an East, a West African country. So when someone's poisoned by a thinking that keeps them from being the them that they know, what they do, instead of punishing them, they bring them in, they sit them down, and everybody in the tribe comes up and they tell them why they like them. And that fixes it. They don't even say what you did, did wrong. They just said who they know you to be and why they like them. And that fixes it. Could you imagine if we had that? <laughs> Instead of the strategic threat assessment whatever committee. <laughs> Like, we don't need all these things. There's another way, right? <clears throat> and so a lot of what I spent a lot of my time doing is like ide ideating. How had we, how were we? What did we do? And what's neat is a lot of Native folks know and remember because like they're still somewhat situated here. However, colonialism's really poisoned us too. It's done a number on us. Um, and it's hard because like we'll create systems of government that exploit, you know, like, it's funny, because back in the day, like, whoever people would call chief, they would see this, like, usual, usually guy, and be like, oh, this guy's in charge. No, nope. it was the old ladies that put the guy in charge. And if that dude ever forgot his role was to serve, the old ladies would be like, no, it's time to find somebody else whose role is to serve. Like, and the role is serve, you know? It's so funny, because, like, the idioms, the axioms that we have in Western society don't make sense. You're at the bottom of the totem pole. In Native culture, who do you think the strongest person on the totem pole is? Person at the bottom. They hold everybody else up. We need to change the way we think, right? Uh, part of the way that economies work is by giving. Uh, the stronger you are, the more resources you have you can be the biggest and best and most giver. And we're all blessed to get to give. And when I get to give, I don't worry about scarcity or lack because like everybody that I gave to is like, oh, hey, Rowdy needs something. Sure, of course, I'd be more than happy to help with that, right? And so we need to get to these more indigenous ways of thinking and being. And there's not a list, there's not a checklist of what to do or how to do it. Um, there's not like one path that's there. I will tell you, if you don't know how to do this, go sit outside and be still and just watch what nature does. Because nature never forgot how to do this right. It's people, it's human systems that forgot. It's ways of being that, we, that, are, that are created through humankind that are, that are the problem. But nature's always been this way. And it's funny because people will be looking at nature and they'll be like, oh, nature's brutal, right? Something eats something else. Well... Look wider, look bigger. You know, when something hunts from the herd, it usually takes the weakest or the oldest, and it strengthens the herd with that sacrifice. And it's hard because with that speciesism things, you know, I have a lot of vegan friends who are like, I'm vegan, oh, look how 
good I am. And I'm like, yeah, man, you're still killing like plants. <laughs> like those are ancestors. Are you slowing down to say thank you, lettuce, tomato, right? Because it's not, you can't, I wish there was a, a calculus where we needed, we didn't have to take life to keep life going, but that's the deal. How we did it before is we, we honored the sacrifice of life that were given to us for sustenance. And then we worked to make sure that that life was good. So if there was berries, we only picked the middle of the berry bush because at the top, there was uh, plenty of uh, berries for the two-leggeds, right? The two-leggeds can come eat the berries. What happens when the two-leggeds eat the berries? They poop out the berries, which has the seeds and the fertilizer for more berries, right? And then we leave the, be the bottom berries for the four-leggeds, right? So then they can eat that and they can spread all that too. There's a way and an abundance in nature that doesn't exist within human frames. And we have to think about how can we be that way more? And the easiest way to start is just to, first off, like, uh, it was funny, I was doing some work uh, for the district and there was a word and they got really worried about it. It was like, you have to engage in self-purification. And they're like, oh, that sounds religious. <laughs> and I was like, oh, trust me, this isn't religious. Uh, you don't have to worry about that. Uh, most religion is like couched in a power structure. And so, yeah, like self-purification is just noticing, oh, I do these things that don't serve me. They don't help me. They don't help me be a good ancestor. They don't help me be a good, a good relation to others. And all I got to do is identify and stop and ask for help and reconcile and come back into proper relation with whomever I'm out of relation with. Um, it doesn't mean it's easy. And it doesn't mean I know all the stuff. It's so weird to be who I am and have my background and ask me, and people ask me to talk about it. And I'm like, I'm like the worst Indian at this. Like, I don't know, but I just know I don't know. And I've asked for help. And because I'm in my process and I can lead with the fact that I don't know, and that I'm open, that I'm vulnerable, and, uh, you know, whenever I'm at the UTech meetings or wherever I'm working with different folks, like, I tell you, I ask them, like, any time I say something wrong or step out of line with my Western thinking, just pull me back. Put me in right relationship. I am a very useful tool of the indigenous community because, like, I have this diversity background. Uh, I'm a decent public speaker. Um, and so, you know, I'm helpful. But I'm not always the best messenger either because, like, I'm learning how to do it right. I'm not automatically doing it right. A lot of those elders have been doing it right for a long time, you know? And you've got elders. You've got wisdom. And I need you to go back and figure it out because colonization tried to scrub all this stuff from you. And I hope you're as mad as me that it got taken from you because that's not fair. And it's a really terrible, horrible thing that happened to you. And you should be every bit as much determined to figure out who you were and how were you when you were the people of the land of Ireland? Who were you when you were the people of the land of China? Who were you when you were the people of land of wherever you were from? And how did they be? And then come teach me what you figured out. Because until I figure this stuff out, I'm going to keep replicating all that stuff. You know, I, you know it's so funny. In class, I ask people to call me Professor Duncan, Professor D, uh, only because it's really hard for like Rowdy to give you an F. Rowdy, why'd you give me an F? I'm like, because you didn't do your homework. And I need to know you know stuff because I love you. And I'm not supposed to say that in class, right? Like, how do we get beyond that stuff? At the end of class, usually everybody gets it. But at the beginning, the middle, you know, it's, it's not what we're used to, right? And so if there's one thing I want to leave you with is it's okay to recognize your colonial thinking. Honestly, I, I need us to do more of that. And when we recognize we, and usually it's so much easier to notice when somebody else is doing it, like, hey, John, you're doing colonization. Like, don't be all, like, mean and a jerk about it. Because, like, I need John to call me out on it, right? I need Mel to be like, hey. I need Roxanne to be like, Rowdy, you're better than this, right? But, like, do it knowing that I'm going to have to say this to you. Do it in right relationship. Recognize that, like, we're, we're what keep each other in check. And that spirit of humility and, like, I need every single living thing to be okay. Like, it brings forth so much gratitude. 
I mean, nature is so abundant. And I get it, man. I know you got like the, the light bill. You know what I mean? Gro- damn groceries are so expensive. And isn't it cool that like, I think Rio's got the garden just over there. You know what I mean? You can go walk around. I don't think anybody's policing the garden. If you took a berry or something. Just make sure you leave some for the other leggeds, right? Um, but sit in there and see that thing and listen and watch. There's a certain rhythm and, and space to nature that will show you how this thing works in a very, very gentle way. And when you notice somebody else doing this thing, understand it's a, it's a way of thinking that we all got poisoned with. It's not any one person's fault. I know some people just want to hate on white Europeans and like, that's not the root of the problem. Like, Navajo people kidnap Pueblo people here. Like, Aztecs, like, slaughtered folks. It's a way of thinking. That's the threat. Fight the idea, not people. People are just symptoms of the problem. We need to, like, alleviate the symptoms and cure them of the thinking and then get back to living in proper relation. So with that, I don't know what my slides necessarily ended on. So I'm going to call it a day here and there. So thank you very much. I appreciate your time and attention. Hello. My name is Sherry Moore Williams, and I am a member of this year's planning committee and also a Rio Salado College academic advisor for STEM students. Professor Duncan, thank you for providing great background and insight for this event. We look forward to hearing more as we bring up our student moderators for Q&A. First, I'd like to introduce our student senator, senator, Becca Namachanja. Becca began her studies at Rio Salado College in November of 2020. She is pursuing an associate in applied science degree in addictions and substance use disorders, which prepares her for a career in counseling. After her selection as Rio Salado's student senator, Becca was elected chair of the Maricopa Community College's district student senator board. Last year, Becca was a member of Maricopa Community College's student public policy forum, which gave her the opportunity to take part in one-on-one -on -one meetings with congressional staff and advocacy groups in Washington, DC. Becca is set to graduate and continue her educational journey toward an undergraduate and graduate degree in psychology at one of Arizona State Universities. She was also just named one of Rio Salado's All Arizona Scholars. Congratulations, Becca. <laughs> Next, I'd like to introduce Cordero Holmes. A Rio Salado alumni, former student senator, and enrolled member of the Thono Athum Nation. Cordero graduated with honors with dual degrees in addictions and substance use disorders and psychology. Now a Barrett Honors Scholar at Arizona State University, he advocates for education, especially within the prison system. Recognized as a 2023 Martin Luther King Living the Dream honoree, he's a catalyst for change in actively supporting the unhoused and presenting at national conferences. Cordero's journey embodies the power of education and second chances. He is set to graduate with his bachelor's degree from Arizona State University in May. I welcome you both to the stage to continue our conversation with Professor Duncan. Thank you. Thank you for that introduction that made us look amazinger than <laughs> we probably feel we are. Um, but thank you everyone for being here. Thank you, Professor Duncan, for um, joining us and sharing your wisdom with us. Um, and for the sake of time, I'll just dive right into the questions. Um, so to get us started, um, and you kind of did a little bit of this with the land recognition. Um, and I thought it was really interesting that you kind of you know, extended the concept of colonization beyond what we normally frame it as. Um, but just going back to the original a little bit, just for the sake of a common understanding, when we think about colonization, one of the things that a person that, or a group of people that colonize do is to strip away the ancestry of the place that they are colonizing. And one thing that they do, um, or that gets done, is the stripping away of the names that represent 
you know, the people, the places, and the things of that culture. So what are your thoughts about when we talk about implementing indigeneity, the use of names to bring that back? So through land recognition, through dual naming, through renaming even, when you think about like in India, they went back from Bombay to Mumbai for their capital city. Um, so can you share some thoughts about that? Yeah, so um, I think it can be of benefit. However, I think the heart in which things are done is probably the most important thing because uh, another thing that happens with colonization is we perform things. Performativity is huge, right? And so uh, with Maricopa, one of the things we were really trying to be very careful with was land acknowledgements because it became a performative event. We'd like to acknowledge these dead people. All right, cool. Let's, get, like, have, let's have some snacks. You know, like, let's make some money and not give it to them. Like, so it's really the heart in which something's done. Otherwise, it kind of just becomes an empty and performative act. And then really, it's the spirit in which that naming happens and what, what, what goes into that ritual or process. Um, we've lost a lot of um, rituals, and especially... Um, I can't remember the name for the thing, like when you become an adult. Initiation. Like initiation, yeah. Like we're... Rites of passage rituals, yes. Uh, initiation too, right? Because like, uh, there was a time where we needed to recognize, okay, you're moving from childhood adolescence to someone who's a full member of our tribe community and has the ability to give, right? And so as long as it's not empty or just a thing that's done so I can have like another star on like my diversity badge, that's really what's most important. Um, I would also say, so, and, it, and there's, a, there's something powerful about those names and the words, and especially the original language that they were written in, because a lot of those words don't translate. Uh, I remember one of my mentors, Roland Walker, at Phoenix College, he was trained in the Diné peacemaking process, but he was, he said, like, I only know how to do it in Navajo. I would need someone to help me try to decode all this into English with a million metaphors, because a lot of those words don't exist. And it's hard because if that can't happen, then we miss out on this opportunity. And so I'd say it is a good and meaningful thing. And we'd have to be aware of how people choose to do it and what's the purpose behind that thing. Otherwise, it becomes kind of performative or it, you know, it can be another form of cultural appropriation. Um, but that's where we got to like, ask questions and get a sense of what's going on and why did that happen. Because some of them, some things can look a little sketchy from the outside, but then you're like, no, you know, elders did this. There's this whole like relationship and background we weren't aware of. Um, but that's how we can give it the space and grace that it needs. Thank you, Professor Duncan. Um, I just want to say thank you. Thank you for that informal land acknowledgement because I am a, an enrolled citizen of the Thorne Waltham Nation, and so uh, these are my ancestors and the Hohokam, of course, yeah. is where we could, where we could descend from. So um, you talked, I like, you had talked about an elder who had told you if they had just took the other foot out of the boat, you know, it'd be different. And I think about the system in which we exist in, because we exist within a political system. And I recently heard on NPR about the power and the influence that indigenous people have on, on native lands and the power to influence the upcoming elections. Mm -hmm. um, how important is it for indigenous people to participate in the, in the process um, on their lands as well as off? So I think participation in a democracy is important. And I do think that there needs to be more of a conversation on how this game's rigged and not winnable. Because everything that's a human-made thing is a game. And it's hard because sometimes our participation in a game gives legitimacy to a game. And, you know, unless we're going to revolt and change everything, we need to find like the middle ground between spaces, right? And, and uh, another thing, especially in the state of Arizona, that has to be acknowledged. There's been a lot of local state efforts. I always have to be careful what I say on Maricopa time. Um, but there has been a concerted effort to strip away native voices in the upcoming election with some laws that were passed between last election and the upcoming one. And those can be circumnavigated to some degree, and sometimes it feels like this political system is just replacing one oppressor with another. Now, one may be more benevolent and one may be more hostile, but 
Um, when we look at hostile and benevolent prejudice, there's still prejudice there, right? Benevolent prejudice is like, oh, you poor native people here, let me give you more commodity cheese, but like, I'm never gonna help you with the reservation. We're never gonna plumb the reservation for you. We're never gonna make sure that there's adequate electricity. We're just gonna do these placative things where you're just gonna visit, take pictures, and then head on. Uh, it's hard because we both need to take part in those elections and then also really show how this isn't working anyway. The only reason why a political system has power is because we choose to participate in it. And I wish everyone just understood the only reason why the game works is because you choose to play. It's funny because as a communication person, I've always wondered why families play Monopoly because there's no like easier way to start hating your family <laughs> than to play Monopoly <laughs> with them. You just hate each other by the time that's done. But it's funny because every family plays Monopoly different. I don't know anybody actually knows the rules of Monopoly because, I mean, the game inherently sucks. Um, so you have to find other ways to make it a little bit better. But, like, I would really love to reimagine the way that system works because currently I don't see the levers really being there for all people to get back to indigeneity, right, where everybody's taken care of not just, like, people but animals, Rocks, land, land needs rights, water needs rights. Uh, we, we really need to realize sometimes the more we play a game, the more strength we give it. And it's not as powerful as it looks. I remember when uh, the George Floyd riots were happening, there was this like thing that said, like, you can't go out, out, out of your house after 7 o'clock. And I was like, <laughs> I went and stood in the middle of the road, like 7.01, I'm like, what are you going to do? You know, arrest me for standing in the road at 701. Like, the laws exist because like we play by them. I think we have a duty to break unjust laws to show that there's no point to it, right? Like if it's in the middle of the night and you're at a red light, just go. <laughs> like it's fine. Nobody's there, right? But we give it power by our acquiescence. And so I think we need to find ways to, uh, to do what's necessary to stop the immediate hurt, and then also find ways not to play games. So then we don't give the system power by not being complicit in what it does or how it does it. So moving forward with that whole concept of the system and um, reimagining it and possibly even resetting it. Um, and going back to the, the analogy that you used and that um, Cordero reminded us of, of if only they had taken the other foot off the, out of the boat, um, maybe flipping that on its head and talking about, well, what if boats had a foot in the boat and a foot on the, on the earth? Um, how, would how would colonization look like um, in a maybe a more positive way where we draw the best from each other's cultures. And so when you think of that in the context of assimilation versus acculturation, and where's that balance that um, society can find to be able to draw the best from cultures um, that are present and past, um, and then discarding, you know, when we're aware of each other's, you know, like you said, John, you should be able to tell me when I'm doing wrong and vice versa. Um, how do we find that balance, especially moving forward? Like, how does the new generation do that? Well, to address one thing, and there's nothing, no problem in, in your question. I just want to bring up this idea. Like, we have to be kind of somewhat anti-boat. Because boat represents sending stuff back to some other place that we're extracting. Um, and really, like, the analogy works when, like, when you realize your feet are on the land you're at. And you're, I, I believe... This is just Rowdy's opinion. So don't go off telling everybody Rowdy said. Um, there's every opportunity to become indigenous to this land too. It's just finding the right way to be who this land needs you to be properly. And I do hear in the root of a lot of your questions is like, well, yeah, we have like cell phone technology. Like cell phone technology aren't inherently bad necessarily. The way we do it is pretty messed up. Like there's a lot of suffering in our iPhones, sadly. Um, there's a lot of suffering on our computers, like when you look at lithium and all those things, right? And there is a way to do that, because um, there's also a lot of profit in iPhones. Like, what if we just paid everybody adequately? You know, it'd probably cost the same, but everybody would have so much of a rich life, right? And so, um, 
when I talk about indigeneity, I think that idea of culture that you bring up is really important because it's really getting back to that original culture that you once descended from that we all need to be teaching and showing one another. Um, and, you know, there's no assimilation process, although there is something gentle about how people are with each other that isn't assimilation. Um, <laughs> when I've been being a bad ancestor with elders, they're just like, oh, sweetie, we don't do that here. <laughs> And I'm like, oh, okay, <laughs> you know, and they're just like, yeah, no, it's fine. Like, just we don't, we don't do that. Um, and that's how like I get shown. And as far as like, uh, you know, culture, like I, I'm a big fan of cultural appropriation, uh, uh, appreciation, not appropriation. And appropriation is just like I know my words, <laughs> stupid words. Um, with uh, appropriation, it's just like, how do I make money off this deal, right? Like, a great example of cult cultural appropriation is goat yoga. Like, hello. Like, this is a spiritual process, and you're taking pictures with goats, and this dude's making money. Um, but appreciation is like, how do I be more that way, right? And it doesn't steal the essence of who someone is, right? And it's me being invited to be more how you are. And it's a bringing in and a welcoming in. And that's something that I think, like, th there are people that did take their feet out of the boat, right? There's, there were, like, white ladies that were like, I'm done with patriarchy. I'm going to go join that native tribe. And they were like, come on in, white lady. You'll just be us now. Uh, there was a lot of, like, runaway slaves that were like, get me out of this mess. And they were like, sure, yeah, just you're now us, right? And so there's a real gentle way of, like, being uh, but it has to be rooted in a respect and a love for what each person brings and the dignity in each human. I hope that answered that question. Um, I, I, I might know the answer to this question, but I'm, I'm curious to know your thoughts because um, I got like a new appreciation for your name now, like Rowdy, right? <laughs> I'm going to ask you later on, what, how'd you get that name and how, did, how, do you, how has that influenced this, your conduct and your personality? <laughs> well, later on, like off. Oh. We're not on there, but um, there's been popular movements in Indian country like missing and murdered indigenous women and two-spirit people, which is uh, just to uh, just to combat like the violence that has has been taking place against you know native women and two-spirited people, as well as like the land back movement. Um, looking into the future, or rather, you seem like the individual that ponders a lot of things. Like, what do you think the next big movement in Indian country is going to be? I am probably the worst person in the world to answer that question. Um, so somebody was asking me once, and they're like, is, digine is indigeneity land back? And I was like, I don't think so. I think that's still decolonization. I think indigeneity is when we all recognize how stupid it is that to think that we can own land. And then it's just, we get owned by the land that already owned us again, right? It's a real transformation in the way all things are seen. Now, currently, land back makes the most sense because, like, we're probably the next best stewards of that thing, given that we have closer connections, but we're still going to mess some of that up. If we are all immediately got the land back, we've been colonized enough that we'd still mess up a lot of that process. And so a lot of it is, how do we get back to recognizing, like, you know, like, it's amazing to think, like, the salinity in your blood is not super different from the salinity of the sea. And, like, what our bones and muscles are made of isn't that crazy different than the dirt, you know? I think it's really recognizing who's owned. Like, we don't own it. We're owned by that, right? And how do we communicate that it's this earth that's creator, that birthed us, that we come from, and how do we get back into being a better ancestor and of relations with that? So I'm not sure where that sits on the spectrum of like what happens in Indian country, because uh, I am like somewhat removed from that thing. But I think like as far as like what I'd like to see happen next is just like a coming back home and like being held and owned, you know, like it's hard because when I say owned, like we're like, uh-oh. <laughs> but like land's always owned us and it wasn't an uh-oh thing because it just loved us, right? Uh, that's, that's a spirit I'd like to see. I'm curious to hear your answer though. Um, well, 
I think I this. Better. I think um, this is going back to the first question I had asked as far as uh, you talked about the systems that are in place. And I like to think that land bag movement fits in there, right, without the colonization, yeah. but as far as being in the stewards of individuals of that land. And so um, I think that individuals of that land who descend from that land, from the ancestors, of the, the stewards of the first stewards of those land, should be more politically involved. Yeah. But I do see what you, which, where you come from when you had said that we were kind of just giving you know, credit and we're giving um, power to the structure that exists. And so I look at it like that, and so I'll, I'll be taking some of the things that you said right now and be pondering on that uh, more later on. But um, I think that's the next big movement is the continuation of some of the things that the indigeneity and the land bag movement, but it looking differently than it looked in 2015 during DAPL, right? Yeah. So that's what, that's what I see. Thank you. I appreciate it. I love not having to answer all the questions. <laughs> well, if I can ask a question of both of you, what is the land bag movement for those who do not know? Um, Rowdy kind of explained it, um, a little bit already where the land back movement is a process of when individuals who were initially from that land were like decolonization. So it, this is like the indigeneity that's a part of it as well. And it's kind of like bringing a spirit of the people that first were on that land to the land. So yeah, another way of saying it, because not, you know, there's a lot of different ways of saying things. One's not more right or less right than the other, is... If you were the person of the land of a specific place, and then you know how to be that people most well. Uh, and two, like when you really look at like lands and seasons and food and everything that comes up, like it's funny because like there's seasonal sicknesses, right? But it's funny because like <laughs> weeds we pick out of our front yard right now are probably stuff that we need to eat so we don't get sick, right? And how do we put folks that know how to be, and I love the steward word, because like within a Western context and like, there's some problems with like the way the Bible got translated because like there are translations that say steward and there are people that said rip off the land for all you can get. Um, but like that stewardship, my responsibility is to make sure that you are as well taken care of so you can serve all of our ancestors as best as possible. And it's really like looking at how can we put native folks in charge of that and worldwide indigenous folks in, as part of that. Um, but I also think too, one of the things that we want to be careful of and aware of is I think indigeneity is also being present and connected to nature. And so if we think we're gonna be absolutely the best at all these things, we're gonna miss an amazing idea from like a colonized ancestor that perhaps is more present in some way that we might be missing that we'd wanna create space so we could hear the voice and like create a need for like having that addition so we don't miss out on this potential good idea. Uh, because I think you can become indigenous once again when you just learn how to be who the land here wants you to be. All right, and with that, we are completing the panel discussion. I'm going to invite John Bastian to lead us with the um, audience questions. So, thank you. All right, thank you, Becca. And thank you, all three of you, just for your contributions for for leading us today. Right now, as Becca said, as Becca said, we're going to invite all of you or any of you who would like to ask questions of Rowdy, but also of Cordero or Becca, if you'd like also. Um, Kirsten and I will have mics available. It's important to use the mics because we are streaming this. And so for the benefit of the people who are wherever they're at, listening and participating through through other locations please use the microphones um, so does anybody want to kick us off with a question or two uh, for Rowdy or for Cordero or Becca So this was a question that we had talked about previously, Rowdy, when we met earlier, as well as when we had our meet and greet, Becca and Cordero, we had addressed this. We were going to save it until the end, but I think it's a, a great time to ask it right now. Could you share with us, in terms of like a call to action and moving forward, 
Beyond, obviously, we know that we can find this information out from different um, resources um, in terms of books, uh, or sources, excuse me, in terms of books, in terms of going online. But if I wanted to do something more beyond being kind of isolated, learning about this from a book, from online resources, where would I go? Is there um, a space where I could go in the community to continue the conversation so that, once again, I'm not just learning about this in isolation? Thank you. I, I would suggest that you reach, reach out to some of the tribes. Reach out to them tribes. Um, I know in cells, uh, my great-great-grandfather, Benito Garcia, has a library named after him. Um, that's one way, so I would, just, I would just encourage everyone to reach out to the tribes. Also, the Phoenix Indian Center, which is closer, uh, south of Central and Indian School, uh, Campbell area, um, go, they're, they're always open to sharing information, and they have meetings once a month where they talk about everything that's happening in Indian country here in Arizona. And, uh, and a book, a good book I would suggest is Vine Deloria Jr. It's called the An Indian Manifesto, Custer Died for Your Sins. I think that'd be the beginning of a great journey. Yeah, uh, for me to answer that question too, uh, I think like, well, you need to make friends with some native people. Cause like, you know, if you just show up on, you know, like, hey, what's up, Salt River? Like, I wanna learn some stuff. They're gonna be like, what? <laughs> like you need a, like an in, right? So like, you know Cordero, Cordero probably knows somebody and can refer, right? But that friend of a friend thing. But the other thing I'd say is like, I mean, we didn't have TVs. We just sat around by the fire and like watch. Like nature's teaching you how to be indigenous all the time, every single second. But are you slowing down enough to watch and listen? It's right there. It's all happening. And it's funny because like, you know, we have a hummingbird feeder in the backyards and like those are like considered ancestor, uh, uh, messenger ancestors. And it's funny because some people are like, oh, I don't know about, you know, because like you get bad news sometimes, right? And I'm like, well, it's not the messenger's fault. Um, but you know, we start to see the ancestors and like note like now I know how hummingbirds sound. Um, I see the rhythm and patterns of nature better. You know, like I recognize like, you know, when it's monsoon season, you know when there's a monsoon. But it's funny because people will be like, Oh, the wind said whatever. And I'm like, Yeah, man, you you know what that feels like too. Like, don't make me all like <laughs> like just go outside, listen, pay attention, and watch what you notice. And it will slowly teach you, um, but you gotta be slow, because it teaches slow, it works slow. And if I can just add really quickly, because I'm originally from Kenya, um, and so coming to this country and trying to learn about the, the history and the culture and all the different you know, political issues and systems that are in place in order to learn how to navigate it, my biggest repository, the repository of knowledge has always been people like going to restaurants and getting to know local, you know, um, if, it's, if we're talking about in the native context, you know, a Native American restaurant, or I always go to the state fair and I always go to the same lady that does a, um, Indian fry bread and she always remembers me and will, you know, chit chat for the year until next year I'll see you. And so just for me, the biggest repositories of cultural knowledge and the most authentic sources is always the people of that culture. So finding ways to engage and connect is, is always, I think for me, the biggest call to action. And one thing I wanted to add is not this weekend, but next, Old Pueblo Grand's having an art fair. Like, go talk to people. Go buy some art. Uh, it's funny, my wife's worried about being the white turquoise lady. And I'm like, babe, we got a Pueblo kid. You're going to have to wear some turquoise. <laughs> Just don't be like that, way, like that version of that person, right? I, I'll, add, I'll add to that. If you go over there, it's going to be a woman named Rosetta Walker. She is an elder and just everything you need to know, it's in her. So if you're Senator Walker, I'm sure I'll send this to you later. Check it out. Shout out to you. Well, thank you. Anybody else from the audience? Any other questions? All right, thank you. Um, so first off, I want to say thank you to Rowdy Duncan for that presentation. Um, listening to your presentation, it brought up a lot of um, like Cordero said, it had a lot of things that I wanted to reflect on for myself, especially as a young Native woman. Um, to me, it's very important to hear other perspectives, especially for people that have 
different backgrounds like yourself because I feel like as an indigenous person, we try so hard to um, understand our own people, but we don't necessarily un try to understand others. And like you said, there is no others, but it's that mindset that you know people are um, raised with. And with that statement, I think I just wanted to ask you, um, when it comes to land, and as you said, um, you've referenced land quite, um, quite a bit in how you've been speaking, um, a lot of indigenous people today, whether it be indigenous Native American people, indigenous Scottish people, indigenous Europeans, whatever, um, a lot of them have a lot of trouble reconnecting back to their roots. And not because they don't want to, but just because they don't know where to start. And, you know, like she says, she doesn't know where to connect with um, Native American communities because a lot of it feels um, distant in a retrospect. So I guess what I wanted to ask you and probably also Becca and Cordero, um, how would you go about um, bringing these bridges of indigeneity and um, going back to the land to these people that want to reconnect but just have no, um, don't know where to start essentially? Uh, so every person's an opportunity to be a good ancestor, right? And if you could see people as an opportunity to be a good ancestor, then how do we create relational ways of being where we are the right ancestor now? Because um, in a high trust, really good, very reciprocal relationships, that's indigeneity, right? Like, I mean, you practice indigeneity with your best friend because you're not trying to, like steal their cards or whatever, you know what I mean? Like, you can't win with your friend. You just play and enjoy, right? And so a lot of it is like, how do you spread trust? How do you spread well-being? How do you spread, like, love and connection? How do you stop seeing others? Um, how do we create more spaces where we are creating these really high-trust, wonderful environments where we're laughing more often, um, where we, you can have the, the worst day and it's okay? And so it takes cranking up your humanness with people and finding people that are more willing to be human with you. Uh, and I also think too, this is one of the questions I know you had written that we didn't get to, is um, you know, people are worried about native languages going away. And one of the things I thought though, is the land taught those people those words anyway. And so even if, some languages go, there would be an opportunity to relearn by listening to the land and it'll show us how to make that word real again. Um, but a lot of it is like doing it in relationship with others, finding like a group of people um, and explaining what this is and how it works and how you wanna be and just stop being so interactional with people and just move towards more deep relationship. And then you'll see how to be that way more. And then as a native person, like, you know, go be curious, like go visit other tribal folks and ask how did, you know, how did you do conflict resolution? What did your governance structure look like? And then we expand on this like common wisdom of indigeneity. I think for me, the, and I th I'm glad that you asked that question because I think about it a lot, both on an individual level and then on a societal level. Like, how do we maintain our sense of self? Um, I think we think, we believe we have a, a true self that we have to maintain and, um, uh, and that we have to operate from in order to be, you know, um, satisfied with life. Like, that is the reason for our being. So collectively, as cultures, we have a certain sense, you know, like a representation of who we are. And when I think about it, the, the, the bump that I always get to is we live in an economic system that does not put value in those things. And so... Unfortunately, we are put in a position that our fight for today is to find ways to give economic, economic value to those things. So whenever people say, oh, like with the whole, um, you know, when I, was, when I first came here and I was a little um, person, girl, it wasn't cool to be African. All of a sudden now, someone found a way to you know, and I'll, I'll use the term African just for the sake of a common understanding. Obviously, Africa is not a country, but it wasn't cool when I was a kid to open my, you know, lunchbox and there was pilau smell all over the place. But all of a sudden now, 
five star Michelin, you know, restaurants are cooking that food. And, you know, I think James Beard last year was a Caribbean person that won um, the, the chef, like best chef in the whole world. So unfortunately, like capitalism is here to stay. And we have to find ways to integrate ourselves into that and put value in those things, unfortunately. So. Um, those were great answers. Maybe I heard the question wrong because I was thinking about more of like an individual standpoint. And I was just going to say, talk to, your, talk to your family members. So um, I may have heard that wrong, <laughs> the question. What was the question again? No problem. <laughs> uh, my main question was, um, as Duncan had referred to land quite a bit in his presentation, and I kind of just wanted to ask, um, whether it be personal or individual, um, because as Native people, you know, we say individual, we're like, you know, go to your grandparents, you know, they're going to yell at you, but still ask the questions, you know. And um, it, it's true. <laughs> they do yell at you because they're like, you should know this. But, um, but I guess what... I was trying to get at, and they answered this beautifully. Um, when you're trying to reach out to different people and kind of, you know, because they want to reconnect to their land, they want to reconnect to their indigeneity. Um, I guess I just wanted, I was asking, like, how do we bring that bridge to them and, like, kind of, like, help them in a way? And so that's kind of what I was trying to get at. Well, I, I think... I think Rowdy and Becca answered that beautifully then. Um, it's just having that, having that close relationship where you're vulnerable enough to build those relationships so that you can practice indigeneity. And to Becca's point, um, making it cool. And I'm using them, making it cool. And so I think, I think that's it. Um, I, was completely, I just immediately thought about talk to your family members. And so I would also encourage them, if you're trying to assist somebody else, to, hey, look into where you come from. Ask your mom and just run the risk of being yelled at because <laughs> it's going to be good for you. Yeah, and one other thing I wanted to say, too, is, like, we don't have to do capitalism either. It's just a man-made thing that we all agree to do. And because we agree to do it, it exists. There's no capitalism in nature. Like, <laughs> like birds, like, I'll give you two berries. Like, they don't do that thing. They just take care of everybody, and everything's fine, you know? Um, uh, some books to read that could help, too, is uh, Robin Wall Kimmerer, uh, Braiding Sweetgrass. Wonderful. Because she says in most uh, native languages, we focus on verbs as our identity rather than fixed nouns. And that actually makes more sense, right? Like, am I generous or am I being generous? You know, like, am I being kind or am I fixed kind? Like, I'm not kind unless I'm doing kind. Good. Thank you. And thank you for the questions. I know Sherry left, had to leave, but already thank you. And I want to thank you all again, uh, Rowdy, Becca, Cordero, um, for participating today and for just having a good discussion, very thoughtful discussion. Uh, and hopefully the people online have enjoyed it as much as we have. Um, let's give them a quick round of applause. You're welcome to return to your seats if you'd like. Um, in terms of, we have a little time left and we're gonna close out by hearing from one of our students. I first met Sonia a year and a half ago, more or less. She was a student here at Rio, a member of the National Society of Leadership and Success, one of our student groups. Uh, and, and we've loosely kept contact since then, and she's agreed to share with us uh, some of herself today. And so we're going to ask her to come up. Sonia is a, a student here who hails from the Towering House people the Bitterwater Clan, Red Running Into Water Clan uh, of the Navajo people, or Diné. Uh, born in Chichilta, New Mexico, which is 25 miles south of Gallup, she spent her early years on the Navajo Reservation. Uh, interestingly, she began working in medicine at the age of 13 when she volunteered in her grandmother's nursing home. Uh, that led to 19 years in the field, in the healthcare field, uh, but she is transitioning to a new career now with a degree in political science and aspiration to embark on a legal career in indigenous law.
Come on up, Sonia. Hello. There we go. Thank you, John. And thank you, Rowdy. That was amazing. To go back to you, obviously, I grew up in a different, more traditional background, so I actually have a lot more feed into my own tradition. So if anybody has questions about that, I can definitely give you a different perspective on things like that. I grew up on the Navajo, um, Navajo Reservation until I was seven. My parents decided to move to Phoenix, Arizona in 1998. And from that point on, I actually understand why they wanted to get us out of the reservation because now that I look back at my family members or my cousins or anybody that's my age are not doing so great. And it happens to be just because a lot of things are getting taken away from us. It's really hard to live in a small town for one. And it's really hard to maneuver from where exactly I am from to a main city. And our main city happens to be Albuquerque, which is almost three hours away from where I'm actually from. So to go back to living onto the reservation, um, I went back every summer to live with my grandma because my grandma was a very big person into our traditional beliefs. And she made me focus on not losing our traditions. And that's a huge thing. I never understood it when I was younger, but not until actually right now I realized what she meant by it. It was more or less to make sure that our future generations will always know our, our native language, not only just our native language, but our native way of living. My grandma grew up in the middle of nowhere. We barely got cell reception probably like 13 years ago, and that's impressive. Like, I still don't get reception out there. There is no internet usage. They are very into you live off what you can produce. We are very, I learned how to butcher when I was nine years old, and that is very traditionally, that's very in there, that's as long as you can live off your land is what I've always known, then you can always survive no matter where you are in, your world, in the world. And that's something else also that I was taught by my grandma. My grandma was an amazing person. She unfortunately had Alzheimer's, so we had to put her into a nursing home, which began the beginning of my, my medicine career. I was 13 years old, loved my grandma to death, wanted to be there every day, every day I could ever imagine. They don't, the people there, the workers told me that I actually was there a lot more than their actual workers. So they told me that they would actually offer me a job when I was 15. I became an activities director, which was a lot of fun. A lot of bingo, let me tell you. <laughs> Literally, a lot of bingo. <laughs> bingo and jello, that's my main. So after that, um, stayed with them ever since, all the way through. Came 16 and a half, they offered me a full scholarship to get my CNA license. Got my CNA license and from that point on, I decided that medicine was probably where I was wanting to be. For the longest time, I wanted to be a neurologist or a cardiothoracic surgeon, one of the two. I feel like there's not too many indigenous Native American surgeons in the world at all. We actually hold up 7% Native Americans are doctors. And that's, that's very, very low. But then I got sick. I got sick two and a half years ago, and I started to realize, started reading more into my people and what my aunts were doing and what my cousins were doing, and I realized there was actually a lot more things going on in the world that we are not actually talking about or speaking about, and I wanted to change that. The only way to change something is by doing, correct? So therefore, I'm now a political science major. I applied to law school. I will start my law, degree, law career next year, hopefully. Um, and in that point, I actually want to teach more people. I want to be a voice to not just the younger generation. I actually have a son that talks about it all the time. He actually spoke for his own school the other day for Thanksgiving on how we don't traditionally do Thanksgiving. We do a day of giving and being thankful, but we don't call it Thanksgiving. And he told his one friend, and they were like completely wanting to know why we don't do it. And he's like, let me sit you down and explain to you what happened to my people back in the day. We don't 
actually read these in textbooks no more. It's actually taken away. So therefore, I feel like it's extremely important for our younger generation to actually start speaking up. And it could start with my child. He's only 12 years old, and he's talking about how it doesn't matter where your background is from. I just want to teach you why we do our different things than what you read upon on, in a textbook. So with that being said, I have two different other inspirations in my life, which is my aunt. My aunt Anna Rundin is probably the best person I could ever look up to in my entire life. Right now, she's an activist fighting for the lands. She was fighting for the Oak Flats. A lot of people don't understand what that is either, which is land and flagstaff that is actually going to be taken away for copper mining. I think we have a lot of copper guys. I think we're pretty fine with that. And then another person that inspires me the most is Dr. Michelle Tom. She's actually one of my cousins. She graduated from ASU. She's actually a formal women's basketball lady as well, which is pretty much amazing. She graduated from Nova Medical School in Florida, and she works on the reservation right now. Her biggest movement right now is trying to open clinics on our reservation lands because it's hard for our people and our elders to get from point A to point B. And a big point of that is we have lose a lot of people in transportation. It takes an ambulance from Gallup to where I'm actually from probably an hour and a half. And in that hour and a half is crucial. So what can we do to change that? How do we change our perspectives on things and how do we normalize modern medicine? Because again, a lot of my people back home are not modernized on medicine. They believe in medicine, man. They believe in spiritual beings. They believe in this prayer. and we have to talk about bringing in both. And I, with my degree, I hope, and I really hope that I can change both and bring in somehow, bring in both my traditional background, my medicine knowledge, and now my new political science career into all in one. And those are, that's my future and that's who I am. Today has been a remarkable time for a looking back, looking at the present and exploring the future. Thank you everyone for sharing. This concludes our event and time together today. I would like to thank our in-person and virtual audiences for our participation and invite everyone to, who provide feedback on this event by using the QR code on the screen. This is greatly appreciated as we plan future events. Thank you and everyone have a good afternoon. Thank you.